Hello and welcome to Programming in Python. In this first video lecture, we will give an overview on the basic concepts of computer science and programming. Firstly, let's look at an understanding of machines, computers, and programming. Provide energy, and depending on the machine's design, it will perform some specific action, such as motion. For example, a combustion engine will drive motion from the energy of petrol or, or diesel fuel. Machines can even perform some simple arithmetic, such as addition, subtraction, division, and multiplication. And here in this example, the mechanical energy is provided by the human hand pushing the cog, and the machine is designed to add two numbers together. Now this basic mechanical calculator can be scaled up by adding more and more cogs, essentially, for larger and larger numbers, and indeed designed to solve specific mathematical functions. And in this example, you can see that it is much, much larger, comprised of hundreds, if not thousands, of individual mechanical components driven through a crankshaft. And this mid-19th century design, called the difference engine, was created to solve a particular function called a polynomial function. Now, a computer, in the modern sense, is a more general type of calculating machine, designed and capable of many types of mathematical functions and even sequences of calculations. A typical modern computer can also make decisions using simple logic. Such a general computing machine requires instructions. And a list of such instructions is what we refer to as a program. And this begs the question, what language should these instructions or this program be written in? Ultimately, our instructions need to be in a language that the computer can understand. This is referred to as machine code. A computer's central processing unit, its brain, is comprised of many, many circuits, themselves comprised of logic gates and not an OR, the typical logic gates. And these gates are comprised of many, many switches that can be in an on or off position, i.e. a 1 or a 0. These switches then imply that we can create a binary number language from many 1s and zeros. If you're not familiar with binary, it's a way of representing our typical decimal numbers, which come to the base 10, to a base 2, or binary. The switches in our computer's brain can be in a 0 or 1 position, and therefore we can take our decimal numbers and translate them to a binary number system that the CPU can understand. In this simple case, we've got an 8-bit, or 8 zeros or 1s can represent the decimal number 255. So a machine's language or machine code is a sequence of binary digits, zeros and ones. Obviously, it will be a big inconvenience for any human to directly communicate with a computer CPU in zeros and ones. So we need an intermediate language. This is what we typically refer to as the programming language. And the programming language is essentially an interpreter between the human brain and the computer brain. So our programming language therefore translates the instructions written in a human readable language to the machine code, the zeros and ones that the computer CPU can understand. It will be very useful just to have a brief overview on programming languages in general, so we can start to see what the differences are. There's quite a large number of different programming languages. If we look at this recent survey from 2016, we can see that in the top five, we've got our language that we would use in this course called Python. We've also got C, Java, and there's a language we'll also compare called Fortran. Similar to normal spoken languages, programming languages develop, evolve, and in some cases go extinct. In the mid-1950s, Fortran developed the first compiler, which meant that no longer programmers had to code in zeros and ones or machine code. You could code in a higher level language that was readable and understandable by humans. Following Fortran in the early 1970s, a general purpose language called C was developed, which was refined even further in the 1980s to include classes and objects. Fortran is still in use today to calculate numerical simulations and is very, very efficient, as is C, which is also in use to program operating systems and software. The object-oriented version of C, C++, while more complex, provides much more power and control 
Much of the software you use is probably written in C++, such as internet browsers and operating systems, office programs, and even websites such as Amazon and Facebook. The Java language was built in using a similar syntax to C and C++ and is also object-oriented. It is now used in the majority of mobile apps on Android and also heavily used in web development. The Python programming language was conceived in the late 1980s. Version 1.0 was released in 1994 and the current version is version 3.6. Python is designed to be an easy language to use and to learn and is a multi-purpose language used for designing web applications, desktop applications, and in our case, scientific computing. To appreciate the differences between these languages, it's worth looking at an example program. Here we'll use the traditional first program that every programmer writes, Hello World, where we ask the computer to print the statement to screen. Let's look at this program written in four different languages starting with Fortran, where you can see the print statement. Next, we'll look at C++, which will look very similar to C. Java, which is, again, object-oriented, so you will see classes being defined. And it looks significantly more complicated than our final example, which is Python. In Python, essentially print hello world, one line to do the equivalent of four, five, six lines in other programs. Computer programming languages are either compiled languages or interpreted languages. C, Fortran, and Java are compiled languages, and Python, conversely, is an interpreted language. A compiled language essentially necessitates an additional step. So once you finish writing the program, you manually compile it. And compiling it converts your human readable program text into object code, which is then executed. So it's another step afterwards. You compile it, you execute it, and the computer runs the code. When run, the program will be very fast and optimized. However, since it's compiled on a specific computer system, it will be platform dependent in the sense that you may not be able to take the same compiled code and run it on a different computer. An interpreted computer programming language, on the other hand, simplifies this process. It removes the need to manually compile your program before running it. In the example of Python, you write your Python program, and when you run it, the Python interpreter assesses the program line by line and converts the instructions and passes the instructions to the computer. While ultimately not as fast as compiled languages, an interpreted language is easier to implement and use. And there's no need for a separate compilation stage, so you can execute code directly on the fly. Next, let's look at some of the specific pros and cons of Python. And in doing so, we should hopefully understand the language a little bit more. Fundamentally, Python is easy to read and to write. And this helps you think much more clearly as you work and program. Python also integrates very easily with other languages, such as C and Fortran, enabling you to call their functions. And indeed, much of Python itself is written in C. Compared to Fortran, C, and Java, you don't need to manually compile. In Python, it's automatic. You need substantially less code to do the same job. And it's also dynamically typed. This means you don't need to waste time declaring variables. Taken together, these points ultimately means that it's up to five times faster to write the equivalent code in Python compared to Fortran, C, and Java. However, because it's not compiled, its runtime, i.e. the time it takes for the commands to be executed, is slightly longer and in some cases much longer, such as for repetitive numerical calculations. In such cases, however, it is possible to optimize the Python program significantly by a factor of 100 using a module called Cyton. We'll look at optimization methods further in a later lecture. In summary, for most computational work, and indeed for most numerical work, this slightly longer runtime will not be noticeable. Finally, let's look at the main three ways that you can write and execute Python programs. Firstly, you can write commands directly to the Python interpreter by opening a command terminal and typing Python 3. Alternatively, if you type ipython, 
eyes in interactive, you will get an enhanced Python interpreter, which enables you to have tab completion and many other features. Here we will show a, a short example illustrating this. So in a command terminal, IPython takes you to the Python interpreter. There you can type and run any Python command, such as print hello world, press and return, and the result is immediately shown to you. As always, you can run simple arithmetic and even import modules and do much more sophisticated programming, all from the same simple command window. Essentially, this gives you a place to experiment with um, commands and is always a, a go-to option to try out some new ideas. Next, we'll look at the second option, which is running a Python script. A script is a simple text file containing a list of commands. Here, we'll show an example of Hello World again, followed by some simple arithmetic, where we print the result. Once you save the text file, save it as .py for Python. Next, you go to your command terminal and you run Python followed by the file name, and that runs the, the script. Finally, we'll look at IPython notebooks, which are now called Jupyter Notebooks. The Jupyter Notebook is a browser-based document where you can run and write Python code together with much more besides, including rich formatted text, video and audio, and you can even visualize within the document itself the output of your data analysis, for example, 2 and 3D graphs and distributions. And even more significantly, such a, a live document can enable you to write a fully self-contained scientific paper containing not just the text of a document, but also the data itself, together with the analysis code and the visual results.